so we want to welcome you as well. I just want to say the, uh, the there's handouts if you haven't been here before. The handouts are just there, and they go along with the uh, the last two uh, conversations that we had, last two sessions that we had. Um, let's begin with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill our hearts with the fire of your love. Hey, wait a second, Father, they're saying that they can't hear you. Can everyone hear what's in here? Yes. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. yes. 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 If you can't hear me, put your hand up. Okay, everybody hears me. Good. <clears throat> um, yeah, come Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and enkindle in us the fire of your love. And may the fire of your love cast a light on our thoughts and on our words, on the movements of our hearts, and on this session that we're going to have this learning how to pray as Jesus is teaching us to pray it is very during this very uh, time together. O oh God, who instructed the hearts of the faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit, grant that in the same spirit we may be truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolation through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Mother Mary, seat of wisdom, pray, pray for you. us. And St. Joseph, pray, pray for you. us. St. Jude, pray, pray for you. us. Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, uh, I just want to maybe give you a little review again why I chose this, um, uh, you know, these talks the way I did. And I'm going to go back to where I started. And that is in the 10th chapter of Luke. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what Jesus was saying. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to Jesus and said, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do this work all by myself? Tell her to help me. The Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and upset about many things. But only one thing is needed. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken from her. Now, the only I, the first the first uh, talk that we had, I went back to settling down with Mary. Why can't we settle down with Mary and listen to Jesus? Why are we so busy in the kitchen and then feeling alone, abandoned, misunderstood, used, whatever it is? Because that's, that's how she feels. She started the whole thing. She invited him. And now what she got herself into over her head, and she has a right to complain. But Jesus is saying that you're upset and distracted by many things. So my whole first talk was, how do we settle down? And sometimes we want to say, well, let, let's get on with the meat. This is, without that, nothing can happen. We're going to be like Martha and we're going to still be flustered. You know what I mean? I'm not getting what I want. So we don't know what happened, but certainly she didn't expect what she heard. I can tell you that. Then immediately it goes on. Now it's the next chapter, but I remember I told you chapters didn't exist. When, when Luke wrote this, he wasn't thinking of now this is chapter. He didn't put that in there. That, those chapters only came like 1,250 and that was just so that they could find the place where, where the quotes were more easily. And even uh, verses did not come in until like 1535. They were just grouped up to that time by um, chapters. Now, so one day Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us how to pray. And then he teaches them the Our Father. And let... And then, yes, uh, last week, I was all speaking about the need for us to 
not only pay attention, but to, to recognize how we are, what Jesus is saying in prayer. I mean, how he's teaching us uh, to pray uh, and, and how he is the whole idea of presence. How can we be present to him as he is present to us? And that was, and we can only pray if we, if we know who we are uh, as in relating to, to God, to, to relating to the, the Jesus and relating to the father that he, because he says our father. And I spent the whole, almost the whole hour on this. How is it that if I don't, if I'm not aware of myself, how can I get into a deep relationship? And that was, and I, I just want to continue on. Now, does anybody have any questions about what I said last week? It's only those of you who were there because I, any questions about anything or you found it difficult or maybe you thought I went too slow or too fast or anything, just let me know. Just uh, put, put, your, um, put your hand up. And there on the bottom, there's a, yes, okay, Peter. I don't know that it's a question. Um, it, 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 it really opened me up. It helped me um, because I, I, I struggle. I do struggle with that. In fact, I've been meditating and praying about it throughout the week. So it was very uh, much, I think, a movement of the Holy Spirit in regards to seeing my father as my my father yeah good my father and and he knows me yeah good well thank you peter thank you yeah anybody else anybody have a question well what i want to do today and i think i told you when i started you're all praying and you're praying well this this uh there's i can teach you about prayer but there's only one person that can teach you how to pray, and that's Jesus. I can teach you about prayer. You can read books about prayer. I mean, you could have a very good swimming coach, but he can't tell you how to swim. I mean, he can tell you about swimming, but in order to get, you got to get in the water. <laughs> you just can't swim without you. You can read all the books on swimming if you, you don't want to get in the water because it's too cold. You go in that, whatever it is. And so what you have to do is you enter into dialogue with the Lord and he will teach you. He's not gonna teach you because what he says, yes, what he says, but how you relate to him. And he says in the Our Father that he wants us to pray to the Father with him. When he says Our Father, it's his Father and our Father. So whenever we pray the Our Father, we have to become more aware. Because as I said, you've probably been praying the Our Father extremely well, but how to become maybe more conscious. Now, that doesn't mean that you're going to do it at every time. I, I'm not suggesting that. But from time to time, catch yourself and say, you know, Jesus, you're there beside me praying with me. You're there because you taught me. And you. this is his great, his great, he has a greater desire to draw me into prayer than I even have it. Because we know that because all you've got to do is look at yourself. I gave you some exercises the first week. Now, maybe some of you did it. Maybe some of you did somewhat. Maybe some, I don't see the value. Or maybe you sort of did it and then say, oh, my, I didn't do it every day. Okay. Then last week, I gave you another set of exercises with a whole lot of passages from scriptures so that you could hear what Jesus says about the Father. It, it, I gave you 20, 20, uh, you know, I didn't expect you to go over all 20 quotes. I said that maybe even if you go over one or two, maybe one a day and just spend time in 10 minutes and say, Lord, help me to appreciate because see, that's the word of God. He doesn't teach you just in this one place in, in Luke. The whole scripture has to be open. He's teaching you throughout the whole gospels. So you have to let, he just, it's okay, now I got it. I know how to pray the Father. No, that's not it. You, he's saying, I want to draw you. Remember what I said originally, when they said, Lord, teach us how to pray. They were not, they knew how to pray, but they didn't say, teach us a prayer. He gave them an attitude. 
He gave them, a, he opened up his, his heart to say, this is how I want you to join me in prayer. So if we really want to pray the, our father, you know, better, we have to start thinking, Jesus is next to me. He's praying with me. He, he's not like uh, uh, Nike, you know, just do it. No, 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 no. He's, we're going to do this together. <laughs> and then he's going to be teaching us how to deepen that. Because as I said yesterday or last week, uh, maybe we don't have a close, we don't have a close devotion to the Father. Well, don't feel guilty about it. Just say, what can I do about it? <laughs> and the Lord will say, I'll teach you. Because we have, and I told you last week, there's two reasons why this, because maybe the way our father or a priest or maybe a mother or some authority figure, or maybe who knows what, a boss or so forth. And we, we associate the, the father with authority. And so we say, well, we got to tiptoe around him, uh, but you know, but I, I reverence him, you know, I do, do it, but I'm just going to sort of, um, you know, I'm, I'm not going to get in his way, let's say. <laughs> I'm not saying we do that, but we do it somehow. In other words, we somehow, for some reason or another, there's not that same heartfelt devotion that we feel with Jesus or with, with Mary. And as I said, if you want to have a heartfelt, uh, uh, and you want to, obviously you're here, uh, in desiring that, ask him to help you. Lord, give, share with me your affections for your father. I don't have them. I have to admit it. Admit in prayer. And ask Mary, because she, she exulted in the Father. When she prayed the Magnificat, my soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. She's talking about the Father. Because that's the only, that's the only, she only believes in, she's a Jew. She believes in the true God. But they, they don't know the Trinity. They don't know anything about the Son or the Holy Spirit. And neither does she. At that moment, I mean, in time. Now, so it's our father and he's praying with us. And since he's revealing that he's our father, he's also revealing I'm his son. And as Peter said, it would be good, I would say, when you pray the our father every once in a while, because we pray it a lot, especially if you're praying the rosary or something, or we prayed at mass. And if you would say, yes, you are our father. You're the father of, of all who are in Christ, but you're my father and I am your son and you are my, and, or I'm your daughter and make it personal because he's, when he never, the father, God, the father never comes, in, you, if you come into his presence, he always sees you as his child, always. Do we see him as our father? Say, well, it's hard. To, don't keep on saying that. Say, I know it is. I told you that. You didn't have to tell me. And so why, there's only one way. Lord, teach me how I can, you know, break through that. Or you can slowly, baby steps, draw me into the Father as you are with the Father. Basically, I want to be with you, Lord Jesus. My devotion to you. Let it rub off, for one or another way of saying it, with your love for the Father. And the same thing with Mary. Now, <clears throat> who art in heaven? Well, he is, and this is, he is the transcendent. He's the creator of all. He's the transcendent and eternal God. And this may cause us to feel distant from him, as I said last week, because he's transcendent. He's up in heaven. Well, he's up in heaven and here I am. I mean, <laughs> well, I mean, what does he mean by that? He means that he's the father of glory. And that doesn't mean we have to somehow <clears throat> try to get up to heaven to talk to him, because what does he do? He joins us to his, uh, his family, God the Father, by sending us his son. Heaven comes down in the person of Jesus. And so then in the person of Jesus, the Father is present. Yes, he is in heaven. He is eternal. But at the same time, in baptism, we have been baptized in water and the spirit. And we are, the, we are daughters and sons of the father, brothers and sisters in Christ. You know, I could give you dozens and dozens and dozens of quotes. 
But let me just give you this one from Hebrews, uh, Hebrews 4, 14. He says what? He said, basically, he says, we have action. It's in Ephesians 2, uh, 118, uh, or 2, 18. We have access to the Father through, through Jesus Christ. What does is, what is, uh, Jesus say? No one knows the Father except through me. And all those whom I, I reveal the Father, they know who he is. Well, he's revealing him to us. Take his word seriously. He just, just doesn't, these aren't throwaway words, you know. Maybe we hear it so often that we just, it's hard for us to remember. Okay, but here's what Hebrew says. Since we have a great high priest, Jesus Christ, who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, son of the father, let us hold fast to our confession. Let us hold fast to our faith. We do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. So then let us go with confidence and draw near to the throne of grace. And the throne of grace is the father. He said with, this is what Hebrews is saying. We can go with Jesus into the presence of the father. He's the throne of grace. To the father that we may receive mercy and find help in time of need. Beautiful. That says something. So, you know, I don't think I ever heard it that way before. Well, then, you know, this is what happened. We, I have been reading the scriptures now, I don't know how many years, I'm 87 years old, probably a good uh, 80 years, <laughs> certainly seriously, probably maybe uh, like 70 years or 65 when I was, but I always keep on still remembering something new all the time, never ends, never ends. What are we going to be doing for all eternity? It'll never end. First of all, we're not in, in time when we're in eternity. So we don't have to make an appointment with the Father. Our time together is not limited to a busy schedule. Well, I wonder if he could see me. Well, you know, maybe, you know, no. We should not speak to him only to tell him what we need, however, but we all, because, and Jesus will go on to that. But how important it is, then what does he say? Hallowed be thy name. Who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. We're familiar with the power of names of people who have authority and who are influential. You know, maybe you want to get a job and, you, and then you know somebody that works in that main office or something. Could you give me a reference? Because you'll say, you know, Jim Smith, I'm, you know, oh, yeah, yeah, he's my, yeah, he, he, uh, he sent me. Oh, well, okay, you'll, you'll probably get a little bit better treatment. Because now there's a connection, a relational connection. You get that? Relational con connection. And so you can, you can say, well, you know, but just, so there's power in the name. The, for, the name has in some way the power is the person, especially now, even for us, but even especially for, for the ancient people like the uh, Israelites and that, there was, when you use the name, that's the second commandment. I am the Lord. Do not take my name in vain. You don't want anybody to take your name. Who said that? Well, it's Norma said that. I never said that. Well, you know, Norma, I had to say somebody. Well, then don't use my name like that. <laughs> You're disrespecting me. Well, don't take it serious. But I will. Like, I'm sorry. You know, if you don't see it, there's something wrong. In other words, when we take the name of God in vain, it offends him. Because we're to reverence that you wouldn't want me to take your name in vain. Then why should we take God's name in vain? But because his name is holy. You see, now there are some people who do use, and they, they, you know, names. <clears throat> Maybe some of you say, oh, you know, I was in a restaurant and Robert Redford was there. If you still remember who Robert Redford is. <laughs> and he was sitting just, you know, in the next booth. Well, what difference does it make? What does that do? In other words, they're, we call them name droppers. Well, I was there yesterday, and who did I see? But the bishop was there, too, and, you know, or who was I saying? You know, well, you know, the senator, he was there, and, well, you know, and I know so-and-so, and the Kardashians, they were Kardashians, whatever they call them. Well, you know, they were in there, too. Isn't that some, well, what, what, what good does that do for you? Or <laughs> That doesn't say anything. You're not, <laughs> we don't use the name. We don't say, oh, yes, I'm the son of my father. Yeah. Well, do you know the father? <laughs> 
Oh yeah, I'm a, I'm a Christian. Oh, I believe in Jesus Christ. Well, I mean, do you? <laughs> I mean, we're all obviously we're striving and we, we sin obviously, but at heart we don't, we want to enter that relationship. You see, we belong to his family. He is present to us by the power of his name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now you notice name droppers are not interested in the people. They're interested in themselves. Mm -hmm. Since I saw Robert Redford in the, in the restaurant, I must be somebody because I saw him. Oh, come on. <laughs> in other words, I am somebody. I have all these celebrities that are in my in my. <laughs> I mean, are they, taught, are they interested in the Kardashians? Maybe they even dislike them, but since they're so important, or at least it seems that way among certain people, or I saw this politician or that one, is they don't even know who you are and they could care less. I know, but it makes me look better. <laughs> Am I right or wrong? <laughs> I'm a Christian. Well, I mean, I'm, <laughs> Is, is, am I a name dropper or am I, or am I, I, I'm still, I'm not a good Christian, but I'm on, I desire to deepen my relationship. And this is what this is prayer is all about. Okay. Um, we, therefore, if we say we must desire what the father desires, thy will be done. In other words, Jesus was an obedient son. He was obedient unto death. And to death of the cross. Because of this, the father exalted him. He wasn't a name dropper. He listened to the father. So if he gave his life. And I say, I'm a Christian. Don't you think I should think of others? Don't you think I should, I should be thinking of others? I noticed that at the entrance of, the, of, Saint, of our cathedral, there is think of others and wear a mask. I don't believe in them, but then think of others. Well, they seem to be delusional, but I'll still think of them because about 95 or 98% do it. In other words, think of others. Be like Jesus Christ. That's what he did. <laughs> he put him, he put others in front instead of him. That's why he came. And so, yeah, I'm a Christian, but I'm gonna I'm gonna do what I want. <clears throat> you know, what does Paul say? Love does not uh, demand its own uh, its, its own way. So, but, you know, we can get into that without even reflecting on the scriptures. Or when I pray, you know, thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. And also in me. Oh, I wish everybody would be in the kingdom of heaven. Well, what about me? I wish that it would come in my heart. That's, that's the, so important. And so to, to pray that in the kingdom. Now, what do we mean by the kingdom? Not, it's not an easy thing to, to, uh, to, to say. You know, Jesus was Christ was, was proclaiming the kingdom. And they said, well, what is the kingdom? Well, the kingdom of God is like a woman who is uh, baking bread. Oh, come on. What's the kingdom? Well, the kingdom of God is like a man who is a shepherd and he has, you know, a hundred sheep. And come, what is the kingdom? Well, the kingdom of God is like a man with two sons. And one of them demanded money. Listen, tell us in 25 words or less, what is the kingdom of God? And he won't do it. It's too much. He wants to give us a lot of parables that will draw us into the story that he's telling us. Have you ever, as a kid, I'm still hoping that we can still do that. I want to tell you a story. Oh, when you tell the story, what happens? You begin to enter into that person's narration. And maybe you even have maybe, you know, images of what they're saying and so forth and so on. And he wants to draw us in. He doesn't want to give us an answer. Oh, now, now I know what the kingdom of God is. That's not a relationship. It's an answer to a question. Give you a good example. We have in chapter 10, I think it's chapter 10 of Luke. Um, the... Uh, a lawyer who's looking for a kind of a debate. It's good, all right. I mean, I don't think he has. He says, you know, um, Master, what's the greatest commandment in in the in the in, in the uh, old in the in the in the law? And Jesus said, Well, I think you, you're very adept to it. What do you say? See, he threw it right back into him. 
And he said, well, to love your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. He said, wonderful, that's right. But he goes on, but he wanted to justify himself. In other words, he wanted this to go on. He just didn't want to end there. He thought he has, he thought he wanted to get into a kind of a little debate. Then, well, who is my neighbor? Well, there was a man who went from Jerusalem down to Jericho. And on his way there, he fell among robbers. And lo and behold, they beat him up and they left him half dead and they took his, and, they, and, and then there was a priest that passed by. And then there was a Levite that passed by. Then there was this foreigner whom we know, I mean, we can't get along with, I know it's surprising. He came along and he put him on his beast of burden. He put oil and, and, and wine. He bandaged them. He took him to the, to the, you know the story. So he draws him into a story. And the guy is being drawn into the story. And then he said, well, what I just told you, who's the neighbor of the one uh, who fell among the robbers? He said, well, the one who was compassionate. Ah, go and do likewise. Do you see what I'm saying? How, what the kingdom of God, it's nothing that you can say. Moreover, the kingdom of God dawns on us. Thy kingdom come. Now we do build the body of Christ. Paul says that. And there's this, because we, the body of Christ is the church. And so we build the body of Christ by our actions, by our apostolate, by our ministry and so forth. Evangelization, etc. But the kingdom dawns. It's given to us. It's given to us. We have in um, Luke 12, what does he say? Uh, Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life. There we go. There we go. What you shall eat or, the bo- uh, or what you shall eat, uh, d- drink. For life is more than food and body more than clothing. Nor be, anx- nor be of an anxious mind. It goes back to the beginning of what we were talking about. I mean, two, two talks about ago. For all the nations of the world seek these things, and your father knows what you need most. Instead, seek his kingdom, and these things will be yours as well. But fear not, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. It's the father who gives us the kingdom. It dawns on us. We're waiting it for it to dawn. And it happens in our life gradually, just like the day dawns. The sun comes up gradually. I don't see the sun just up. Oh, all of a sudden it's all up. No, you have to wait for it. Okay. Now, these three petitions. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. They're all focused on the Father. So he's saying, if you really want to know how to pray like I pray, (laughs) didn't you ask me to teach how I'm praying? This is how I always pray. I focus on the Father and I realize how I relate to him. And I give him his due honor and I tell him also that I'm going to be obedient. And I can tell you he will always be there for you as he is there for me. Now, those are three petitions. Now, he's going to go on with four more. But the four petitions that he's going to give us now are all about what we need. And we're going to come to the Father and ask for something. So it isn't like he says, now, just don't ask him for anything. Just, you know, just just be focused on him. Yes, be focused on him, on yourself as well. But in relationship to him, he's not a vending machine. No, he's not. And so we have to recognize that. Now, I'm going to stop. Does anybody have these three? I'm going to take the four. Now, we're going to have some other questions. I mean, other uh, devotions as well. I hope we have the time. Maybe we won't have the time. If not, I'll take it into next week. I want to go over into other prayers that we always pray other than the Our Father. I want to go into the Hail Mary. I want to go to Glory B, the Apostles' Creed and also the Divine Mercy Chaplet, and the, uh, the, the uh, devotion to the saints. I'm going to see it all through the lens of the Our Father, but we cannot see these other 
prayers to deepen them because you're praying well with them. And, and that's where your devotion is. How can what, what the, Jesus is teaching us in the Our Father, how can that shed a light and deepen all of our other prayers that you have been praying? But I'm just going to stop here now. Is there anybody that has a question that doesn't, I would prefer questions because we don't have a whole lot of time. I would love to have a discussion, but we just don't have, I hate to say it, Time goes faster than I think. Uh, in, are there any questions that, that you have about what I said? Maybe that puzzled you or you thought maybe I you did, did anything? Anybody? No? Okay. Now, now let us, what does he say? Okay. Now teaches us, Jesus teaches us to focus on our needs with four petitions. But as our father, not as a sugar daddy. Give you an example. I had a conversation with a man, very, very distraught. He was very, very hurt. He was divorced. He had a son, maybe about, uh, maybe about 14 years old now. But it was a very divisive divorce, maybe about six, seven years before that. <clears throat> and somehow he, uh, for one reason, the, the, the uh, the, 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 wife, the ex-wife and her new husband, they moved up north and he agreed to know that, she, she, they could, that the son could go there with them, but he would spend six weeks with him in the summer. He thought, well, I'll have six weeks of quality time with my son, with my son, rather than have the son go from back to forth each week or something like that. So now about, he's 14 years old, now the, his his the new husband of this, the, the mother, she's very, very wealthy, all kinds of money. And so the, he's not hearing from his son. He said, oh yeah, let's call him Jake. Jake, you coming down? He said, well, let me think about it. I want to, yeah, but you know, uh, Harry, who happens to be his, his stepfather, you know, they're, my mother and Harry are gonna go, and they're gonna go on a just excursion to Europe. And he said, I could go along if you don't mind. And he said, well, he said, what are you saying? He said, well, you know, it all depends. Now, if, um, you know, if you can do something that I really think I can enjoy, maybe, you know, something really, uh, may, you know, in other words, that would be entertaining. In other words, he, nothing he ever could do will ever measure up to that. And he said, well, let me think about it then, okay? He said, well, maybe I could fit you in because they're only going to be gone like, uh, they're only going to be gone like uh, three weeks. Then maybe I could fit you in three weeks. Oh. Now, is that a relationship? Or is that what can I get out of you, dad? <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. It's hurtful. The man almost was weeping. Maybe I could fit you in. Mm. All of a sudden, you see. What's the important thing? He also knows that his ex-wife is still getting out for him. I mean, it's sad. It's sad to see all that. I don't want to go on to that, but you understand. Now, the first thing, <clears throat> I like to give you these daily experiences because you think, oh, this is so lofty. It's not so lofty. It's embedded in our own life experience. Yes, we do ask, but we ask in what, what spirit? And if you say, you know, maybe I am a bit, well, then just say, Lord, sometimes I think I am a little bit, at, you know, you know, gimme, gimme, gimme. Help me to see that. Because you see, whenever you pray these petitions, Jesus is praying these petitions with you. And if you are going overboard and maybe being too blow to yourself or something, over time, he'll let you know that. I promise you. Why wouldn't he? Prayer is a school that teaches us our relationship with the Father and with Jesus and the Holy Spirit and the saints. It's, it, it, it's, all, it's all sort of cloth of one, you know, fabric of one cloth. So <clears throat> give us this day our daily bread. That's the first petition we ask for ourselves. God is the provider. What do we say? You know, Father is traditionally the provider. I think a man is supposed to provide, protect. And they, when he said daily bread, I have no doubt the Jews, they are very well aware of it in the Exodus, how when they were in the desert, the God, as far as is the father, they, again, they didn't believe in the Trinity, gave them manna every day, but it was only for one day. 
In other words, they, they, they took that manna, they had, but they could not store it up. If they went to, oh, maybe I'll take, maybe I'll take two or three of these bushels or something, it wouldn't work. <laughs> According to that, the other, it goes, it only was good for one day. In other words, you got to trust. You got to trust in me. I'll give it to you every day. And so to say this, you know, and so, and we have a sense, we do have a sense to be, I'd like to have more. And we do, that we want to store up things and so forth. We should, that doesn't mean we shouldn't have, we shouldn't have uh, financial security. That doesn't mean we're those. It's just the fact is that not, that, that not be the source of our security. Yes. Is, is when Jesus says, you know, having a lot of money doesn't give you uh, assurance of a long life. Plus, the old idea is where are our hungers? Am I hungering for, you know, the essentials of life? What are my desires? The Lord will sift us. We, you know, we ask for a lot of stuff that we shouldn't. Have. You have your own kids that did that. I want this. I want that. All you got to do is go to the grocery store. And so, I, mom, I want that one. And listen, she has to tell them, listen, all those things are not that good. You have to, she'll give it, she'll provide, but she's not going to let them eat a lot of junk food or maybe spend money where they shouldn't be spending money. So the Lord it, it will teach us this. Okay. Now, I want to say something about emotions. You know, if we don't feel, devotion usually has to say, it touches the heart. It touches the heart. And it's true. But, and sometimes we feel a kind of a welling up. There's a kind of a consolation and that's wonderful. And that's what the Lord wants to give us. He wants to give us his joy. But in the daily life, we're not always consoled. Look at your own relation, relationship with your spouse or, or your kids or something. You're not always, you're not always consoled. I'm quite sure when you get up in the morning or your spouse gets up in the morning, oh, I'm so consoled. I can get up at six o'clock and I can go to work. I don't know. No, no, I am not so sure about that. <laughs> in other words, your dedication is there. Your relationship is being deepened. But you just have to go on love and dedication. And forego the sense that, because that's precisely what happens when an infidelity, they're looking for a little, few more sparks and then they get, to, they get into a fire. So in other words, we have to sense, hopefully the Lord does want to console you, but if he doesn't for some reason or another, we, uh, we had Job there just was it two weeks ago, but less than already from the Old Testament. Okay. Now, this is a biggie coming up here, really biggie. I can tell you this, the most difficult thing that the Lord asks us to do. Well, first of all, there is a good thing. There's two parts to this. The first part, it's a biggie, but it's usually easier to do, but not always. Forgive us our trespasses or forgive us our sins or sometimes forgive us our debts. In other words, to ask forgiveness. But in order to ask forgiveness, we have to know that I've been responsible for something that was sinful. And what do I know is sinful? You know, what do, what do, how do I, my conscience? And it's not always easy. It's not, oh, I don't want to go to confession. I don't need to go to, I just tell God and there's no problem. You know, well, I mean, how do you, you know, telling somebody else, I don't know if you know the 12 step program for alcoholics. Their fourth step is to make an inventory of their life to sort of make an examination of their hearts. And, their, and then the fifth stone is that they have to tell somebody, find another, another person. I've done a fifth step with a lot of people, usually maybe their sponsor, but maybe they want to do something, go to a clergyman or, or somebody else. They got, you got, why do people write to Ann Landers and all that? They, they want to tell somebody. <laughs> In other words, we need to get it out of ourselves. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's hard for us to admit it. You know, what do I do? What did I do? I don't do it. I'm 87 years old now. What do I do? Well, I can tell you, I don't want to ask all the parishioners. They might tell me because <laughs> they hear me all the time. <laughs> In other words, ask your spouse or ask your kids or ask your sister or brother, you know, and he, if he has courage. But of course, he might stay away from it because, oh, that, that's a time bomb. I'm a, oh, they're OK. You're OK <laughs> because I want to be OK. <laughs> and so forgive us our trespasses. We've all been wounded. We have a weakened will. 
we, our intellect has been dulled and our passions have been disordered and even sort of stirred up in, in, in a disorderly way. And Jesus at the very, he came to forgive our sins. Every time we go to mass, we will hear this at the words of consecration. This is the cup of my blood, the blood of the new and everlasting covenant. It will be shed for you and for many. Why? For the forgiveness of sins. When we, that is the blood of forgiveness. We don't, we can't forgive on our own. Forget about it. I mean, that we can't, I mean, he wants to forgive us. This blood is poured out for me so that I can be forgiven. And when we come up to, to, we do ask before mass that we would forgive us our sins. And maybe we don't have that much time to do it. Uh, but even maybe when we're coming up to com communion, we could say, you know, Lord, for, because he, we're receiving now, even though we can't take the blood now uh, in the cup, but Jesus is Christ is, is present his body and blood in, in the host and say, Lord, you shed your blood to forgive my sins. I come, you know, the worst the thing that ever happens if somebody has hurt your feelings a lot and you say to that person, well, you know, you, 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 way you snub me and so forth, but I forgive you, you know, and he'll say, for what? I didn't do anything to you. <laughs> Get over it. <laughs> we have, so in other words, people don't like to be told that they, they did wrong. They don't, and I don't. <laughs> so we're all in this together. But then, uh, we'll, we'll talk more about this when we get to the chaplet of divine mercy. We'll talk more about this whole idea of forgiveness. Um, then, what do we say? As we forgive those who have sinned against us. Well, that is very difficult, especially when we've been very, very hurt. When we forgive, that doesn't mean that we condone, say, oh, that's okay. No, or we're not saying, you know, uh, you know, just forget it. And you're not going to be able to forget it. It's going to be there. And you'll say, oh, I'll overlook that. It, it'll be in bed. It'll stay inside of you. You don't condone it. You don't give him an ex you don't excuse him. And sometimes, hopefully, reconciliation would happen. But sometimes it doesn't. You know, if, if a woman comes to you and, and, and she's been beaten by her husband and this has been going on for several years and that it's finally going to, you know, and she said, you're going to say, well, be reconciled to him. He's going to take advantage of her again. He, she should forgive him before God so that she's free of that bitterness because that bitterness can do her in. Some people hold a grudge all their life, even somebody who's been dead many years. And they carry that person and that person doesn't even know it. Or doesn't care. So to forgive. We're going to say more about this. Uh, Charmaine and I were talking about it. Maybe I can give you some talks on forgiveness during Lent. If that's the case. So um, forgive us, you know. Well, I remember one person said to me, well, only God can forgive sins. And I said, yes. Well, then how can I forgive him? God's supposed to do that. Oh. I mean, I'm off the hook. Let him do it. I'm. It's his job, not mine. <laughs> I said, but he empowers us to do that so that we are like him. Jesus says, forgive others, then you'll be like my father. And he will give you, I, he gives you me, he sends me so that I can empower you to forgive. You're not on your own. You're not on your own. Just think of the, think of the, the altar in, in the cathedral. If I would say to any one of you, you know, I would like you to move that altar. You say, this is crazy. How could you even think of it that I could move that altar? Well, to say, you just forgive people and let it go. It's impossible. And especially when there's a deep wound that goes very, very, very deep. Like, for example, being abused and that. It's terrible. And it might take a long time. You know, before before we, we view, but it might take a long time also for us to forgive because they hurt us so much, especially when something happened when we were kids. Monsignor. Yes. Uh, if I could make a make a comment quickly, sure. um, in terms of forgiving others, one thing that has worked for me is to recognize that Jesus was willing to forgive others 
And who am I then not to forgive someone? You're absolutely right. We, if we want to be in the family, then this is the family that Jesus is inviting us to. He has, he was obedient and he was forgiving. In fact, his, his, those who, and they were not reconciled at the, uh, he didn't, they weren't, he wasn't reconciled with most of the, the people who were taunting him, but he forgave them. Father, forgive them. Now lead us not into temptation. This petition might be a little bit puzzling. We say, how could God tempt us? Well, we have to see it again in the bigger context. See, we just can't stop one thing. You know, a lot has been given to us. For example, let's go to James, uh, the letter of James, chapter, uh, chapter 113. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil. And he himself tempts no one. So he can't be tempted and he tempts no one. Each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desires that are disordered. And so there you have it. You say, well, this is contradictory. Well, it's not contradictory unless you look at what is, what is this, what does he say? Lead us not into temptation. Sometimes people would say, you know, maybe what we're asking the Lord, Lord, when you lead me through life, keep me away from danger zones that weaken me. Guide me on the path that is safest for me to walk at this time in my life or today. In other words, be a guide that, you know, I have certain things. Maybe when I was a kid or when I was 16 or 18 or 20, there were certain danger zones and I wanted to maneuver around them. I wanted to avoid them. You know, lead me in such a way, lead my path in such a way that it is safe. And then the last one is the live. It's the, uh, the it's actually the fourth one. Uh, deliver us the Lord, petition or the seventh one. If you can count the first three, deliver us from every evil. No, deliver us from evil. And sometimes it's also translated the evil one, and that is Satan. Throughout the entire Old Testament, it is God who saves and He protects them from evil. And Jesus is confronted with evil at the beginning of his of his uh, mission, his public life. And he confronts and he says, be gone, Satan. And he gives his disciples power to overcome and to dispel Satan. And we were baptized renouncing Satan. And we do that every Easter. I renounce Satan. We, we renew our baptismal vows. I renounce Satan and all his empty promises. I renounce Satan and all his lies. And so he, I, we, we, we renounce the source of evil. That's our baptismal heritage. And he asked us to pray that every single time we pray the Our Father. There's a battle going on. And you know, even in the, uh, uh, the beautiful prayer that Zechariah uh, uh, you know, sang, uh, the birth of his son, John, he said, you know, and deliver us from the hands of all who hate us. Evil hates you. Wants to destroy you. So we say, deliver me from that. Deliver us. So this is the last petition then. But I, you notice the deliverance comes at the end. At the end of the uh, Our Father. Before that, I'm going to go over it again. The first three believe that the Father is my Father, and I am his Son, that he is the Father of us all. Seek his kingdom, and also to do his will, not mine. Then being obedient children, fulfilling his will, that's the yeah, three, being obedient children. Trust his provident love for us as our provider, love's essential, and forgive others, ask forgiveness and forgive others. Because if we don't do that, at least somewhat, at least somewhat, we'll never be delivered. If I'm holding on to a grudge, and if I, if somebody says to me, "Well, I'm he's he's I'm gonna I hope he goes to hell. I'll never forgive him." But you know, I want to be delivered from this this uneasiness or this spirit. Say, so, you know, are you willing to at least open the door a little crack to let the light come in? No. Well, then I don't think I'd want to go to deliverance because there's a stronghold there of evil 
because we have to at least begin. I'm not saying that we're going to do it. As, we have to, you know, when somebody, uh, Peter is asking Jesus, how many times do I have to forgive my brother if he sins against me? Seven times? He said, no, 70 times seven. In other words, it's a process. We might have to still be forgiving people that, that, that maybe hurt me when I was bullied in seventh grade. <laughs> but it's, it diminishes its power. And I become more freer, freer, freer. We all go baby steps. And don't be too, don't be too disappointed in yourself if it's not easy. The Lord, remember, who's praying with you? You're not praying alone. You're praying with Jesus Christ, who forgave. He'll empower you. Ask him. Don't, don't say, like, yeah. Another, another a thought and tell me if I'm off base here, but it would seem to me that one of the most essential questions we want to ask ourselves in our life is why, why do we, why would we refuse to forgive another person that we feel has trespassed against us? I mean, you know, I think asking that question to ourselves is a real critical question that we should want the answer to. Well, there's, I, I agree with you wholeheartedly. Um, What's your first name? Jeff. Jeff. Um, I don't know what, what the, the population of the world is. There's several billion, but there's seven billion <laughs> answers to that because everyone has a good reason to hold on to it. And that's mm -hmm. why it's so hard because we're justified. We're justified. And in a certain sense, you have to agree with them. They are. Forgiveness is to give before. And you can't do that. In a way, you'll say it's not owed to them. But God says, be like me. I, when yes. I forgave you, it wasn't owed to you either. Now, that's why it's so hard. And that's why we have to pray more and more to be in the spirit of Jesus and to be empowered by his blood. That's when I use that example. You say, well, that's a rather strange example. Who could meet you all? Who? And, and I'm, hopefully, if I get a chance to, to do sessions on the forgiveness, uh, I will, Jeff, I'll... I'll uh, have this a little bit more. Uh, I'll go into I'll go into it much more, much much more. I have to just go on now. So I noticed that we're almost finished, and I wanted to get into the Hail Mary. I wanted to get into the uh, Glory be to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The, uh, the and the the um, we did the Our Father, the Hail Mary, Glory be, and the, and the uh, Apostles Creed, and that will help us in praying the rosary. And then I want to go to the divine mercy because that that's basically is a very popular thing, the chapel of divine mercy, and then devotions to the saints and novenas. And that will be for next week. Uh, but we have to see all through the lens, through the enlightenment, through the the, uh, how should I say, through the view of Jesus teaching us how to pray. And you have been praying very well. Now, you'll, and don't, don't say that this is going to happen. You're going to be forgetting and you'll just, that's why you have to take time. To, how am I praying to our Father now? now? Because often we're going to pray it very quickly and that when you pray the rosary, I understand that. I'm not saying, but you know, from time to time, say, oh, I just have to become conscious of that. Maybe on your own sometime. Because when you're praying your rosary together, you just can't do that. You can't just stop and respond. But I'm saying this, that you get an attitude. I need to listen and, 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 and pause and say, you know, what, I, what, what you taught me, Jesus, in the Our Father. See, I'm teaching you about the Our Father. Jesus is the only one that can teach you the Our Father. He's the only one who is truly son, drawing us into his family. Does that make sense what I'm saying? Does that make sense? If it makes sense, put your thumb up or you put your hand up because I don't know, am I getting through or, you know, or is this difficult? You say, no, I don't understand what he's trying to tell me. It's too difficult. Is it that, have I said anything that's too difficult to understand? It might not be easy to hear, but I don't know, have I gone beyond what the scripture says? No, no Monty. Senior, this is Susan. I gotta tell you, I don't think I'll pray the Our Father again the same way after today. Yeah. 
Well, hopefully. I mean, it's, I know it's good to have that, but we will slip into it. Don't, uh, Susan. Uh, it'll do, and then you have to say, oh, oh, let me wait. Yeah, I'm getting back into old habits again. If you have old habits, uh, it's not easy, to, especially prayers that we pray so often. Prayers that we say so often. And we don't, but we have to be patient with ourselves. The Lord's not, has, has Jesus ever beat you up because you weren't praying the Our Father like he wanted to? Who have been beaten up? Who have been beaten up? Who have been beaten up? You're not praying like you're supposed to. Whoever heard, did you ever Jesus come and shake the hand and say, why aren't you? He's not going to do that. <laughs> He's pleased you were praying to him as you were praying to him. He's just saying, just, I can help you a little bit better. To deepen this. Does that make sense? So I'm yes. not saying, you know, you have not been praying to our Father well. You have been. And I want to say this over and over again. Because people say, well, you know, he must be saying that we haven't done. I've never said, I never said that. I'm saying is, you can grow in a relationship. Grow in a relationship. Relationships can always deepen. And we do get in a rut and we do we are forgetful. And, you know, and uh, routine heads in. And we're, you know, and evil is there to also tempt us uh, to be waylaid. And so, you know, evil will say, oh, it's not that important to pray. And then we don't pray. Why didn't you pray? <laughs> and then it's then, then <laughs> In other words, he got you. It's a double whammy when it comes to the Lord. I mean, to, when it comes to the devil. It's a double blessing when it comes to the Lord. Mm -hmm. So anyway, we, we have time now. Is anybody, I think we have a couple minutes yet. Anybody have anything to say or to comment on what was said? I heard once or two, two or three. Anybody else? We're going to start with the Hail Mary. Yeah, Kathy. I'm senior. I had read last year, uh, and it's maybe true or not, that Rome was thinking about changing the line in the Our Father, lead us not into temptation. And well, the, yeah, you're right. The Pope said that, but I really don't think that I personally, it might be, but I don't think that's going to go anywhere uh, okay. personally, because um, I know it's, it, it, it's very dis difficult to understand. But, but if you did that, you'd, you'd talk about there would be a hue and a cry. I can tell you that much. Why do we still say our father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name? We don't talk like that here anymore because that's the way we learned it. That's why. Yes, that's right. And I think if we would say, no, we're not going to say thy, we're going to say our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Mm -mm, no, 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 no. I, I think if you touch that, now maybe they will. They don't, don't want, if they called me up and asked me, I think I'd give them that. <laughs> but they're not going to call them and ask me. But I, the Pope does say that, and I think it's good to teach why is it said that way. And it has to be done in other areas of the scripture that enlightens the way Jesus means it and not the way we have a tendency to take it. I, do, am I answering your question, Kathy? Yes, thank you. I just wondered how far Rome had gone with it. but I, I don't think I've never heard anything personally. Okay. You know, the Pope will say something and then it, because he's trying to teach us. But I don't, it'll be teaching us like I'm, I'm, I've never said to you from now on, then we, we have to change. No, no, no. Well, first of all, he's the Pope and I'm not, but uh, I just don't think, I don't, I don't think it would, uh, you know, there's other bigger fish to fry, I would say in the church. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Anything else? Well, yes. Monsignor. Yeah. Uh, I appreciate what you've shared with us about the Lord's Prayer, but I also want to say, in addition, I appreciate during your Mass, uh, I think it was even this week at one of the 815 Masses, where you have a style where you instruct as you're uh, present, presenting the Mass, and particularly this week, you pointed out when we're praying to the Lord as opposed to when we're praying to God. Do you recall that? Mass? Oh, yes. Yeah, because the whole Eucharistic prayer is to the Father. But yeah. then right after that, before, then we pray, Lord Jesus Christ, you know, and then we just before, but then we change, we, then we pray to Jesus Christ. See, it's good to know to who, which person of God. And I just want to say this. It's so important. It's not absolutely essential. You're still praying. But when you become more aware of the person to whom you're addressing, it becomes more personal. Yeah. Great. That's, a, that's great. Now, I only do that. I know I can get on people's nerves if they go say, don't oh, so But what I do, I only do it with, if it has something to do with the, with the scriptures. 
I don't want it's, to introduce it. You know, it has something to do, and it was all about the father. And I like to, the, I, many people, I know many people have been gone to mass for 20, 30, 40 years, and they think that they're praying, the Eucharistic prayer is directed to, to Jesus. Yeah. Jesus is with us praying to the father. Well, what difference does it make? Well, I mean, this is the way Jesus said, pray our father who art in heaven. And the church has taken him so seriously that even in, you're talking about when I was talking about forgiveness of sins, when you go to confession and you confess your sins, what does the priest say to you? God, the father of mercy, through the death and resurrection of his son has reconciled the world to himself and sent the Holy Spirit among us for the forgiveness of sins. In other words, it shows that there is like a family affair going on here. And I'm drawn into that. And that enhances our prayer. Amen. But if you say, well, I don't want to go there. That's okay. You'll still be praying. But it's good for us to know to whom am I praying. And as I said, the problem in the Eucharistic prayer is that the Father is very... Every time, every time Paul refers to God in any of his letters, he always, always means the Father. And we know that he'll say God and his son. Well, then you know he's talking about the father. Because if he says and his son, he's the father. But I know this woman, she, she prayed for years, but she thought that she was praying to, to, to Jesus. When she told she said, oh, was I praying wrong? I said, of course not. No, I'm just helping you to, to you know, pray better. And whenever Good. you're receiving the Eucharist, the, 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 the uh, confess, you know, go, go to confession, God, the father of mercies, the death and resurrection of his son has sent the Holy Spirit among us. There is a trinity right there. And to try to appreciate that, we deepen our appreciation who, of who God is personally. Well, thank you. We're going to end with, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Together, we can pray that. You don't have to put your dick in. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, amen. God bless you, see you next week at four o'clock and we'll be doing the Hail Mary. You could ask somebody if somebody wants to come, even come in new, Hail Mary and the glory be and the Divine Chaplet. Peace to you. Goodbye now. Thank you, Monsignor. Thank you, Monsignor. Thank you, Monsignor. Thank you so much. Bless you. Thank you. Everybody have a good week. Awesome.